Feeling the Wednesday energy, my black marker refilled with ink and ready to go. Very exciting to all of you, I'm sure. Uh, birds today start our, what will be a multi-class journey towards Antarctica. So they have a, a group of chin strap penguins pictured here. You can probably see how they, how they got that name. And uh, here's a, a more zoomed out version to see this, uh, this penguin colony uh, on, uh, on this kind of barren, rocky island. And uh, they, can, they can strike a, a dignified, almost martial pose. Uh, they will sometimes try and eat small shellfish in the surf or, or drink the seawater. Um, they are a very noisy species of bird. They make a lot of noise by themselves. They make a lot of noise all together. They make a lot of noise at each other. But, you know, they also court, uh, court other penguins with uh, the predictable results. And uh, uh, something that's always striking to me about these kind of uh, far south habitats is kind of how they're just on these rocky islands with giant glaciers and, and mounds of snow and, and the penguins are, are there and, and thriving. Uh, so as you, you may have noticed, today is one of our rare no, no plickers days. Um, doesn't mean we're not going to practice, just not with, uh, with the plicker cards. Uh, but before that, any questions about uh, the lab, about objects, anything we've been looking at? Here. Can you go over how self works with the class structure again? Uh, absolutely. So we have, um, I'll just bring it up on the screen actually. Um, we have here our point class. Uh, it's a 2D point X and Y. And we might say something like uh, point P equals point of two, three, and another variable q equals point at negative one and 10. And then, that is really not what I wanted to do. Uh, and then we might print p uh, out here. And so when we go to print p, to turn it into a string to be printed, it will call uh, the wrapper underscore underscore wrapper underscore underscore method that turns objects into a string. And so we go into this method and we need to turn the point into, the, into a string. But not just any point, we need to turn the point P into a string. So there needs to be something about this method that accesses the specific data inside of P in order to turn, uh, in order to produce the string like two comma three rather than you know some other uh, pair of numbers. So the way that Python does this is within a class definition, uh, we have. Uh, self and this is uh, one way to think about this is self is the particular object that a method is being called on so when we go to point print p, p we p's repr method is called, and in order to have a variable that represents p within that method, that will be self. And so when we want to, as part of turning a point into a string, get the x of that particular point and get the y 
of that particular point. Self is standing in for whatever object that method is being called on. So when we go to print out P, Repper will be called where self is P. So this will essentially be P.X and P.Y. When we go to print out Q, we'll call Q, Q's repper method, and Q will be filled in for self, and so it's as if we're saying Q.X and Q.Y. And so indeed, we'll print out P and Q as expected. And so the motivation behind self is we need some way within a method to refer to the object this method is being called with. Either, in this case, get the x and y of the object we're calling repr with. And the syntax for that in Python is we have this special thing, self, that we use as a kind of placeholder as this is going to be whatever object we're calling this method on. What questions do you have about, about self? Because this is definitely a, a, a tricky concept. Ava. I know you've explained this before, but I'm just a little confused. What situation would you need to use the object self? Like, what's an example of like when you couldn't just refer to the so, um, so you mean why couldn't we just say X and Y here and not bother with self? Yeah, I still just don't really see the function, like the use of it. Really. Yeah, so we, um, <clears throat> as part of, um, So it might, let's look at a different object. Let's look at our, our history class that we used in, in lab one. So someone calls our get length method. So Somewhere we had, say, history one. Dot get length, and so this get length should return the length of this specific history, because there may be many different history objects, each of which might be a different, have a different number of of actions recorded in them. And so when writing the code for get length, as is here on the screen, we need some way to refer to this history one object. Or if and somewhere else We might have history two dot get length, and so we need to write get length in such a way that when we call it with history one, it gets the length associated with this object. When we call it with history two, it gets the length associated with this object. And so that is what self is allowing us to do. Self is. Um, Like you, one way to think about it is that self is a placeholder. It's just something that we're uh, that we use in these method definitions as a way of kind of standing in for history one or history two or whichever history thing we're calling get length with. So. Uh, in this case, we want to get the internal list, cell, uh, which is a, an attribute called history. We want to get that internal list and return the length of it. And so by saying self.history, 
because self is standing in for whatever object we call it with, it means that when we do history one dot get length, we're doing history one dot history. When we do history two dot get length, we're doing history two. Um, and another way in which self is, is important is that we're used to thinking of functions as their own little world, that anything that we um, create in uh, a function, any variable that we set up in a function only exists inside that function. But that's going to be a big problem if we want to uh, have an object that say has some, has some data like uh, a list or an X and a Y and that these variables need to be used in multiple different fun uh, functions, multiple different methods. So, for example, we need to use this history in both the get length, get most recent, get past action. We need to use the history in all of these. And normally, we like wouldn't have a, a variable that could be created in one function and used in, in others. But if this list, if this history is part of an object, is part of self, then when we use it in, when we refer to it in one method with self.history, that, and we, so we call history one dot get length. And then later we call history one dot get most recent, we can refer to the same, the self.history will be history1.history and history1.history in both of these methods. So there's also a way for us to kind of share, have the same way of referring and accessing the data inside an object across all of its methods. So when, when we do a constructor there, why do we have to define history as a parameter of the function? That's, that's a good question. Why do we not need to have like history as a parameter to our uh, constructor? So if we have something as a parameter to the constructor, when we want it to be able to start, as different things. Like if we did, if we wrote the constructor like this, whoever calls the constructor passes some list as an input, and that is what our history starts as. But in this case, we want the history to always just start as an empty list. And so when it's always going to start at the same thing, then there's no reason to have it as a parameter because no matter what someone provides as input, it's always just going to start as an empty list. And so we wouldn't even use the parameter uh, if, if we had it there. So this is in contrast to our point where depending on what a person passes in for x and y, that's what we want the point to start as. We want to be able to have a point start as 2, as 2, 3, or as negative 1, 10, whereas the history, history should always start as an empty list. Other questions about, about self, objects, anything that I've just talked about not clear? This is, <coughs> this is important stuff for us to, us to feel comfortable with. All right, so I'm going to start out with practicing some terminology uh, since when we, what we have been doing with objects and classes, this is often called object-oriented programming, and object-oriented programming is full of all sorts of terminology to refer to all the different pieces and types of things we've been dealing with, so I'd like all of you to uh, uh, 
write down in your own words uh, definitions of the following five things. A class. An instance. An instance variable. A method. And a constructor. All right. Let's uh, let's talk through these together. Uh, can someone share uh, what you're thinking for class? What what's something that 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 could mean in the context of of objects? Sam. Creating an object that has a certain set of instructions that you can later use, that you will define later on, so that you could call upon. Essentially, like point is, you're, you're making a class point, so that, that way you can refer to it later. Exactly. That this is. <coughs> the definition of an object that we define once and might use later when we want to actually use that object in some way. Just like the definition of a function, just defining it doesn't cause the function to happen. Just defining a class doesn't cause that object to exist. It just defines what that, what that means. Does anyone remember what are the two kinds of things that make up the definition of an object. Eric? Functions and data. Exactly. This is functions and data. And that's what is being defined by, by a class. How about instance? Someone want to share how you thought about, about that term? Max? Um, I said it's a version of an object. So it's once you've called it, once you've called the class, and then like you're actually using that in the code. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I like how you said using the object. Uh, uh, an instance is, is an object actually in use, and they kind of put it in, in terms of, of a computer system. I might say, an instance is a specific object that is in the computer's memory as a way of describing an object in use or an object that exists. I would say that it's in, in memory because that's on, in a computer system what it means to exist is to be in the computer's memory. Other thoughts on, on instance or questions about that? In the code on the screen, what, if any, are the classes? Emma? Class point. Exactly. Capital P point. That is the class involved here. You can tell class, capital P point, colon, starts the definition of, of the class. How about instances? What, what instances are there? Gabby? Um, Why do you say P and Q? Um, because they're the instance or classes being used called to then create one of those objects is the point as to create an object. Exactly. We can see the, the class being name being used as a function, which we know constructs an object. So line 10 constructs a point object. And line 11 constructs a point object. And then the part about in memory, we know that when we assign something to a variable using equals, 
we take that value, we put it in a slot in memory, and then we label it with the variable name. So our line 10 and 11 create two points, but also importantly, put them into memory and give them labels we can use to refer to them, P and Q. How about instance variable? How, how would we define that? Anyway. A variable that we assign to an instance. A variable inside of, associated with, uh, yeah, I might say a variable that's associated with an instance. Now our our instance variables show up in both with instances but also with classes because part of a class defining the data is defining what instance variables objects of that class will have. So what are what are the instance variables of our point class? Yeah. P and Q. P and Q are our instances. So they are the two points, but then there's variables inside of them uh, that would be the instance variables. We've also called these attributes or fields are other names that, that we we call instance variables. Sammy? Would they be uh, with, within point two, three, or next to the time? Or would it be the X and Y of the construction? Hmm. So this is, this is a, a useful distinction. When we say instance variable, do we mean the x and y inside, say, our init method, or do we mean these values 2 and 3? And in this case, it could be either. That depending on context, you might say the point has instance variables or say attributes x and y. We know this because in our constructor we see we give self.x a value and self.y a value. Whenever we see self dot something inside our class definition, it is either function or data. If it's function, it's going to have parentheses after it. We'd be calling it. Otherwise, it's data, which are creating instance variables of that class. So point has attributes or instance variables x and y. But we'd say if the point class has these attributes, that means p has an x and y, and q has an x and y. And so we have p dot x and p dot y as well as q dot x and q dot y. And so these are the instance variables of, of q, x and y, in this case negative 1 and 10, are their values. Instance variables of p, also x and y, have values of 2 and 3. So we can think about the instance variables or attributes of an instance, a specific object will have some specific attributes that will have particular values, like we have 2, 3, or negative 1, 10. Or a class, in general, defines that all instances of that class will have an x and y. Does that distinction make sense? What 
questions on that or, or parts of it, it'd be helpful for me to, to go over again. All right, we'll talk about methods. How would we define, define a method? Gary? So method is like a function, that's a thing Exactly. That our objects are made up of functions and data, and we have these different names for the data part or the function part. How, what are our methods in the in the code on the screen? Cole? Okay. Absolutely. Refer is is a method. How how do we know? Um, it's a function within the class. Exactly. It's a function that's defined inside the class. Therefore, that that is exactly what a method is. Any other methods on the screen? David? Yeah, init is also a method. It's also a function defined as part of the class. Now, init is a special kind of method that has a special name. What name is that? Construct. Exactly, yes. That <clears throat> our constructor will always be in Python, double underscore in it. And how would we how would we define a constructor, this special kind of method? Gabby? So it's a function method that is basically the one that creates the object and kind of all of the, sets all of the parameters that we need to for it. Yeah, it's a method that's responsible for setting up an, an object, and I might say for setting up An instance. Like whenever we create an instance, a specific object in memory, we're going to be using the init method to set that up, for whatever that means for a specific object. What is our, what is it that our init method is doing for our point class? Cool. It's saying to be a point, I'm going to need an X and a Y. So if that means here's my X and Y. Exactly. It sets up an instance, which often means <coughs> that it's going to give our instance variables an initial value. In the, in the case of point, it will give our instance variable x the initial value that was provided as a parameter. Same with y. All right. Other questions about any of these, any of these terms, any of the the code on the screen. All right. So something that we might reasonably want to do with our point class is to be able to add points together. That if we have our P and Q, 
I want to be able to add them together and we want it to print 1 13 so like add the X's together and add the Y's together and give us that resulting point but unfortunately Python does not know how to do this it says unsupported operand types for plus point and point doesn't know how to add those together but something that's pretty cool is that we can tell Python how to add points together such that this P plus Q will actually work so there are a number of these double underscore methods that let us define how a class interacts with kind of the standard arithmetic or other sorts of things um, and so if we want to do addition that's double underscore add <coughs> always takes in self and in this case we're going to be adding ourselves to some other point as when we add two points together we need to have both points so we'll have a second parameter that I will call other In this method, I want to create and return a new point that is self and other added together. Where added together means the two x values are added together and the two y values are added together. So please work with your neighbors to use what we know about creating a new point and accessing its instance variables to give us the one line of code that will create, a, create and return a new point that is self and other added together. You might think about how would you use, say, P and Q to get the X's added together and the Y's added together. All right, let's let's talk about this add method. So let's break it down into pieces. Uh, if I wanted to get the new x value for the, the result of my adding these two points together, uh, someone give me a suggestion for, for how I would do that. Cool. So dot x plus other dot x. Exactly. So we can access the x value in both self and other, and those are numbers, and Python already knows how to add numbers together. So we can just add those two together, get our new x value, can do the same thing for our y, new y is self.y plus other.y, and then I want to return a new point that has these values new x and new y. So what what would I do here? Okay. You could just put like points and then in parentheses like new x comma new y. Exactly. That I could construct a new point, set a uh, create a new point. Its x value will be new x. Its y value will be new y, and then return that that new point instance with this add method. I indeed get, uh, oh yes, 113, there we go. And the original P and Q have not changed at all, which is what, <laughs> what we were going for. We wouldn't want the statement P plus Q to have changed the original P or, or Q. Questions on this? So on. Could we add 
define just like one like the header point, which is point self dot x plus y Absolutely. So, so it points out that we didn't need to do this in three lines like I did. We could have done it all on one line like so. Other questions? Okay. Just a quick one about that. Which way, like if you were actually coding this, would you do the one line or the all those? <laughs> Uh, so I would personally do the one line in this case because the one line is simple enough that it's okay that there are multiple steps on one line. Much more complicated than, than something like this, and I would probably want to break it onto to separate lines. There would also be absolutely nothing wrong with doing it doing the three-line version. So I think this case, just, just a matter of taste. Other questions? All right, so this is something that's pretty neat about Python, is that we can uh, tell Python how to add a new kind of, uh, how to add new kinds of objects. Uh, if we wanted to, we could tell it how to subtract them, multiply them, test if they were equal, test if they were greater than or, or less than, um, and enable objects to, that we defined to be used with all the kind of normal arithmetic or, or other operators. And as we've already seen, the repr method lets us define how an object is displayed as a, as a string. So what I'd like to do now is demonstrate a couple of, of kind of advanced object-oriented features um, with the goal being to kind of mention these features, demonstrate a, uh, a particular application of them, um, and these are things that you will uh, encounter quite a lot of uh, if you were to take uh, uh, the next uh, CS course, CS 201. Uh, but in this course, it's more just seeing that there uh, that these things are are, are possible, um, but but not worrying about uh, all the the details and and applications of them. So. What I want to do is I want to create a sort of uh, kind of little uh, uh, little video game, and it's going to feature this uh, little uh, space invader uh, uh, space invader thing. And so to do this, I'm going to need some things from PGL, uh, and so I'm going to be typing a lot of code. All this code is in in the notes, so uh, please focus on on following along. Um, uh, with the code reading rather than, than code writing. So I'm going to need a G image, which is going to let me display that little space invader on the screen. Uh, I will need a graphics uh, window, uh, and I'm also going to need a rectangle. And I'm going to need a way to make random numbers. And I'm going to make an alien class. It's going to be my, my space invader. But I want this alien class to be able to do all the things that a graphics object can do. And up until now, the only way that I w would be able to do that would have to like redo all the graphics object methods myself as part of the alien class. But there's something in object-oriented programming called inheritance which means I can have one class inherit or borrow all the methods and data from another class. And so I'm going to have my alien class be a G image. It's going to just borrow. It's going to be able to do everything a G image can do. And then I'm going to add more stuff specific to my, my alien class. So want my I want my constructor and 
it's going to take a graphics window and an X and a Y position. And the first thing I need to do is I need to construct the G image part of my alien class because it's borrowing everything from G image. And so I actually need to set that set that up. And so I do that by saying uh, super parens is a function that gives me access to the class I'm inheriting from, which is called a, a super class. But the idea is I need to set up my G image, which will take my uh, small alien picture and the X and Y location. I'm going to set up some more instance variables, which will be familiar from uh, the breakout lab. Then I'm going to want to keep track of uh, an X and Y velocity and keep track of the graphics window that this alien is in and add myself to the graphics window. So we now have this alien class. It's going to look like a little space invader. Uh, so let's write the code that will actually kind of start up the graphics window and, and uh, start, start the game that I'm making. So I put this under this if double underscore name equals double underscore main as this if statement is only true if I'm running this specific aliens.py file. If I had another file that, say, imported something from this aliens.py, say, imported my alien class, I would not want this code that sets up a graphics window to run, so I put it under this, this, this special if statement. So I'll make my graphics window 600 by 800. And I'm going to make a background that covers the whole window. So I want the background, I'm, I, I want this game to look like it's in space. So I want the background to just be uh, uh, black. And so I'll make a rectangle that is uh, filled and the color it's filled with is black and then I will add the background and I'll also add an alien at uh, I don't know 300 400 so let's run this when it opens up and I indeed see my little alien there in the middle of the screen. Questions on this so far? Yes, Mara. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused still about the, like, the super parentheses. Can you explain that again, please? Yes, so this uh, uh, super parentheses says access the class that I am inheriting from. So this start to my class definition of alien says my class alien is going to borrow everything from G image. If I want to say call a method from G image, the way that I can do that is call the super function. Now I have uh, a reference to the G image part of alien and then I call its constructor. Because I need to construct the G image part in order for the actual image to show up at a position. Because that's the stuff that I'm borrowing from G image that I, I don't want to have to do myself. Other questions? All right, so a Space Invader sitting stationary in the middle of the screen, not, not much of a game. So 
I'm going to make the Space Invader move. So the first thing I'm going to do for that is to write an update method that is going to just like move the Space Invader according to its current speed. So uh, the Uh, the graphics object gives me a, a, a move method, and so I will just move it by its x velocity and its y velocity. And then I will define an update method in here or an update function rather, not a method, it's not inside uh, uh, the class definition, um, where I have a list that I'll call objects, that's all the, the objects currently on the screen, and for each of those objects, I will call that object's update method. So I just want to loop through all the things that exist in my game and tell them to, to update. Like one, uh, whatever that, that means, for the alien that means move. And then PGL, the graphics window, has this set interval function, which is a way to say you give it a function and then a number. And this says every 10 milliseconds call this update function. So every 10 milliseconds, call this update function, which will then go through all of my objects and tell each of them to update. So it's just a way of making the game run. If you look back at the code for breakout, you'll see set interval being used in there as well in order to make, uh, uh, make the ball and paddle move around. Um, all right. So let's see if this works. Not quite yet. Ah, yes. Excellent catch. My alien is not actually in my objects yet. So, I actually need this alien to now be a variable that I can add to both the graphics window and put in my list of objects. All right, it slowly trundles off the screen. And interesting that moving leaves it in the middle. Perhaps that will, that will be resolved. Do you need to do, uh, or, like, why would it you need to do the super for the self.move? Isn't it moved from the G image? Uh, yes, so this is some of the, like, messy details of this inheritance. Uh, before I do this part of the constructor, I have not set up myself as a G image yet. So the, the first time I need to do something from gimage, I use this super. But then once I do that, now self I can use to access anything in alien or in gimage. So the actual game that I had have in mind is one where uh, I need to, I have aliens moving around and I need to click on all of them uh, and get rid of them in order to win. Clear, clear all the aliens. So I'm going to use PGL's ability to handle like mouse clicks, which uh, came up in, in um, uh, which came up in, in part in, in uh, lab two. So going to define a function called mouse down action, which is just like what happens when the mouse clicks. And this will be given an 
event object which will tell me where the mouse was clicked. And then I will check, is there any element at the X and Y location of the event? And if there is, if it does not equal none, then uh, if my element has a method called mouse down action, so if this thing I've clicked on has something defined for what should happen when you click on it, then I would like to uh, uh, call, call that method. Otherwise, if I click somewhere that's not on an alien, I want to create a new alien at a random location. So somewhere between 0 and 500 and the X and somewhere between uh, uh, 0 and 700 in the Y. And I'll get rid of this initial alien. So now when I am clicking, it is uh, creating the alien. Interesting, not showing. Ah, yes, so the part that I have not done is I then need to tell the graphics window to uh, listen for when the mouse is clicked, call the mouse down action function. So this is how PGL, uh, uh, you can set it up to when the user presses a key on the keyboard or <coughs> clicks the mouse for it to call a certain function. All right, I'm now getting my, my drifting aliens at, at all sorts of random locations. Very exciting, but not quite, uh, not quite the game yet because I want the challenge to be when I click on an alien for it to disappear. So that I make a bunch of aliens, then I need to try and click on all of them. Uh, uh, to go away. So first, I am going to make them bounce off the walls. So if its x location is less than zero, or its x location is greater than the width of the graphics window, then I'll reverse its x velocity. And I will do the same for the Y. And then that's going to make the, the aliens bounce. Let's make sure that works. They're not going to the bottom because I didn't change width to height but they are, they are bouncing. And now I need to make the uh, aliens do something when, uh, when they are clicked. So I'll remove them from the graphics window when, when I click them. So I make some aliens, I start clicking on them, and my program crashes with a list when I try and move one of the things that I, I removed. 
So I removed it from the window, but not from the list of objects that I'm updating. So one solution to this is to give the list of objects that I'm updating to uh, this mouse down action and then uh, remove myself from that list at the same time I removing, I'm removing from the window. So now I can make them and I can start clicking on them. I am a winner. It's terrific. But thank you. Thank you. I know it's, I'm, I'm, I'm excellent at video games. Uh, so I would like this game to actually be hard as opposed to trivially easy. And so I will use one more uh, of my advanced objects features. And that is so far we've only seen data that is specific to an instance. But we can also have data, a variable, that all instances of a class share. And something from the classic Space Invaders game, where this like little uh, alien thing comes from, is that as you destroy aliens, they get faster and faster. So I want that to happen in this game. So if I define a variable outside of any method in a class, this is what is called a class variable, or it's also called a static <coughs> variable. It just means a piece of data that all instances of the class share. And so now anytime I create, I, I construct a new, uh, a new alien, I'm going to add one to this population. And anytime I remove, I'm going to subtract one from the population. And then I'm going to make a get speed factor method whose purpose is going to be to tell me what I should multiply my current speed by based on how, how big the population is. So if the alien population is greater than 10, the factor is 1. If the alien population is greater than 5, then my factor will be 1.5. So I'll go 50% faster if there are 5 or fewer. The population is more than two. We'll go twice as fast. The population is greater than one. We'll go four times as fast. And if none of those are true, we'll go eight times as fast. So I'm using the fact that once I return, I won't do any of the code below. So that's why these can all just be ifs. So even though if the population is greater than 10, it's also greater than one. Well, if it's greater than 10, I will, always, will already have returned and won't ever get to the population greater than 1. And then when I'm moving it, I'm just going to multiply it by self dot get speed factor. All right. Let's see if this will do what I want. All right. So I make a bunch of them, start clicking away on a trackpad. Nope. Now they're whizzing around. <laughs> Ooh, wasn't sure if I was going to get that one. All right. That was a lot of code, but I just wanted to show that there are some uh, fancy things objects can do and to, um, that maybe you can make use of in your final, final project, which we'll uh, be talking about uh, next week, or you'll see more of in, in CS201. So lab due tonight. Uh, I have office hours starting in 10 minutes. Otherwise, I'll see you on Friday.